very much for this uh, nice introduction. Hello, good morning to uh, everyone. So, why, well, why are we here today? So first of all, I'm very, you know, I should say thank you for this invitation. Very honored to be here on stage presenting this work. Uh, but I have a question for you. Why are you here this morning in this room? And what I mean by that is why do we care about uh, sound vibration? Why ICSV? Why IIV? And I guess maybe despite a little bit what Marcus uh, said uh, uh, during his uh, keynote, I think it's because of noise and because we currently don't have this. So you know that we as uh, Homo sapiens evolved and we developed something to protect us against the very bright light of the natural light like sun and thunder lights but we did not grow yet any ear lead so i think that's a little bit of my story so why what's my why in life my why is really uh, the ear the human ear so what are the type of technologies that could be uh, developed around the ear to protect it, you know that it's very sensitive uh, sense that needs to be protected against the danger of harmful noises. And how can we enhance the human experience through the sense of hearing? So for that, I developed a lot of uh, technologies together with my team. And for the next two hours, I'll be speaking here without any interruption. No, for the next uh, 38 minutes, sorry, I'll be sharing a story. And that story is really how uh, the research uh, team that I led worked together with an industrial company called EERS, e -E -R -S, and turned technologies into products, uh, into sometimes uh, commercial successes and sometimes uh, without any uh, commercial success. But I'll be sharing that uh, story uh, in five uh, books. So the book number one is really about hearing protection. So how do we protect against uh, the dangers of uh, excessive uh, levels? The book number two is how we can communicate better in noise. You know, that it's a challenge. Book number three is about what we can do inside the ear canal in terms of sensing. So actually, the ear canal is a nice place to do some biosensing. We can sense a lot of the uh, things that do happen on your, in your physiological system from inside the ear. Unfortunately, today I won't have time to go into uh, book number four, which is about the stimulation, but I believe that in the future, we may even treat heal through the ear. So not only treating uh, tinnitus and some other uh, auditory related diseases, but even you know, uh, prevent some uh, motion sickness uh, disease, uh, some uh, mood uh, therapy and so on, that could be uh, done through various modality, be it electrical stimulation, uh, thermal stimulation, vibration stimulation, and obviously acoustic stimulation. And um, I won't even uh, comment on the fact that we are slowly, um, sorry, slowly starting to uh, collect some energy from inside the ear canal. And I think that's really relevant to this place. So we heard yesterday um, from Vim that this used to be an old uh, chewing gum factory, right? And believe it or not, we were able to prove that when you chew, when you draw, your jaw movements uh, are going on, you have what we call the T, uh, temporal mandibular joint, uh, jaw joint that is distorting the ear canal. And from that, we were able, for example, to recreate some electricity inside the ear canal using piezoelectric material. So when your hearing aids are running low, just chew some shun gum, and there you go. For the, you're good for the next hour. So. Let's uh, start and let's uh, dig into our first book, Hearing Protection. So, I mentioned the fact that we need some uh, passive hearing protectors. That's the way we can really block the sound. We can as well do what we call fit testing. So, fit testing is a new way to really assess that an earplug or an earmuff has been properly fitted on a worker, let's say, and does prevent actually noise from leaking through. The third point is the fact that we can actually measure the exposure, not simply with a microphone, not simply with a dosimeter on the shoulder, but really inside the ear canal. And this is really something that I'm you know, actively uh, pushing towards some standardization to have new standards on in-ear uh, exposure. We can obviously reproduce sounds inside the ear canal. So you all have uh, probably MP3 players and you're all listening to music or audio uh, feeds through those earphones. And this is obviously things that can be optimized and can be developed. 
and uh, you can as well play back things that have been heard or perceived in the ambient world. So think of digital audio filtering. You can have a microphone outside and you just let uh, signal, signals that are useful get through. So this is the type of uh, feature you do have, for example, in your AirPods nowadays or all those uh, MP3 and digital products. And when you have that microphone and that uh, speaker inside the air canal, you can add, as well do active noise control. So the idea of cancelling actively by inverting the phase of that disturbance and cancelling the noise uh, further. And one last application that you can do for hearing protection is uh, monitor what we call the auto-acoustic uh, emissions, which is a natural um, stimulation of the uh, ear and of the outer hair cells uh, to assess the uh, health, let's say, of the auditory system. So let's start with the passive hearing protection. Are we good for the audio uh, on the audio side? There should have been some a little there. Well, you didn't hear Nick, uh, but there was um, my colleague. So Nick Laprell is uh, the uh, young uh, entrepreneur that you see on the right of this picture. And uh, at the time we met, and you can see, by the way, at the lower, uh, lower um, part of the screen, you see 1999, so this is really when that story started, so 25 years ago. I met that young uh, Canadian entrepreneur in Montreal, and he was uh, coming out of a family of uh, hearing aid dispensers. So he knew about the uh, dangers of uh, excessive noise. He knew about all the risk uh, and the increasing uh, risk of uh, damaged uh, ear ears, and uh, he was into the idea of designing some smart earplugs. So he thought that could be useful for 30 million workers that are daily exposed to excessive levels of noise. And since he was an entrepreneur, he really thought that he could do uh, some buck, uh, some money out of that, uh, that innovation. So the first time he interviewed me, he said, well, the earplug is ready. Can you make it smart? And obviously, uh, I answered yes, and I said, uh, we can certainly you know, improve that earplug, and that was the beginning of my PhD project, so working as a PhD student at the University of Quebec, and working as Sonomax, that's the name of the company, uh, CTO, so Chief Technology Officer, for the development of a smart earplug. So the earplug uh, that was envisioned at that time was based on that patent that was issued by years, uh, Sonomax engineers, sorry, and the idea is uh, really here uh, illustrated by the fact that we would inflate inside your ear canal a balloon, so something that would be like an envelope that would be filled with a silicon rubber, so a liquid rubber that is in orange, you see on the, red, on the left the pump. The pump will flow that uh, liquid silicon rubber inside the membrane. The membrane will expand and mold actually the exact shape of your ear canal in three minutes. So in three minutes, you do have something that is custom fitted comfortable, made out of a soft a silicone rubber. And please pay attention to the green sound bores. So there were some tubes through the earpiece and they will be used uh, later in the presentation. So the concept was very fine, but actually manufacturing that earpiece was a real challenge. So you see, it took us two years and you know, that's only in uh, 2001 that we got the version one of that earpiece. And shortly after that earpiece was uh, ready, we had to certify it and launch that. And so this is my uh, uh, really original view of the uh, very first conference I attended. So that was back in 2002, a National Hearing Conservation Association in uh, Dallas, Texas. And we were just um, having that earplug ready with what we call the NRR. So NRR is the noise reduction rating. So this is really the label of attenuation on the earpiece. And this is something that we sometimes call NRR, stands for not really relevant, because you see that it's actually not really useful as a number, you'll see why in a minute. But nevertheless, we had to test those earplugs, and you can see how the version 1 uh, evolved to a version 2 uh, that was always better and refined, and eventually a version 3 with a superior uh, performance. So those lab uh, certifications were uh, useless in the sense that uh, an NRR is not really relevant, but it was really a good opportunity for me to meet uh, you know, many people and knowledgeable people in that field of uh, hearing conservation. So an important aspect uh, was indeed that fit testing uh, concept. Chapter two, fit test. 
And some of you may have recognized a, a colleague of mine uh, that will be joining the story a little bit later, Elliot Berger. But here, really, the uh, idea was that, well, you have a good earplug. How can you assess that it's actually good? So how do you know that it's actually providing some good attenuation? And so that was my very first uh, candid, let's say, attempt to simply insert inside that earpiece. So here, pay attention. You see that through the earpiece, you, that, you do have that sound bore. So there was a tube, an opening for the microphone uh, doublet to be inserted. So the piece in blue is the microphone doublet. You see that you have two microphones. One is outside, picking up the ambient noise. And one element in, the, in green is inside, connected to that uh, red tube and going through the earpiece. So each worker, after the earplug was inflated, uh, would be tested for the attenuation of the earpiece. And the system was driven by a software. So the software would send, actually, a broadband noise uh, stimulation. So you see the loudspeaker to send some white noise. And you would typically record outside noise, inside noise. And the difference is what we would call uh, the personal attenuation rating. So PAR stands for personal attenuation rating. And so at the time, this was what was uh, called or dubbed uh, the Sonomax solution. And the Sonomax solution really by 2005, I would say, really got some, uh, some traction. I think there were more than 40 licenses uh, worldwide that were using that technology. And you know, slowly but surely, it got the attention of big players. And uh, one day, uh, you know, one of our salesperson came back to me and asked, well, Jeremy, this is cool that you can test those custom earpieces. But could you test some foam plugs? Because foam plugs are really everywhere, and people need to test those disposable products. So how would you do that? And so at the time, I just said, well, that's certainly very easy, four steps and 50 seconds. And what I proposed was simply to go and pierce the uh, foam plug. So you recognize here a classic uh, ear plug. And you just core drill a sound. And then you pull a tube through it. And then you connect the microphone uh, doublet and so the microphone probe, and you can, in you know, a couple of seconds, have an earplug that can be tested using that uh, system that we call the field microphone in real ear uh, measurement. So as a PhD student, you know, my next uh, logical step was, well, to write a two-pager, and so this is really what I did, and we sent our salesperson back to the, uh, to the market, actually to a congress, NHEA, just with a, a few uh, samples. So the samples were those uh, earplugs that were uh, equipped with that sound tube and uh, a nice uh, sticker and a little uh, case. And good luck with this. And actually, it made, uh, made a hit and got the attention from a company that was called Aero at the time. So Aero, E-A-R, is a, a company that was manufacturing those, uh, those earplugs. And as soon as we uh, got back from that conference, I was you know, tasked to find ways to core drill those earplugs. So you see how, you know, very, it's very uh, lit, little uh, syringes. I was uh, trying to core drill that earplug, run the tube, and so on. And since you are all, you know, really interested in acoustics, I should say that the tubes were a real challenge. Because if you're running a tube to an earpiece, you need to make sure that the tube is very uh, isolating in terms of sound. The sound is loud outside. Uh, weak inside, you don't want too much leakage through that tube, so the tube needs to be very uh, thick in terms of uh, wall thickness. But at the same time, you need uh, the uh, tube to be very flexible, so you want that thickness to be well, minimal. And you want as well to have um, a very uh, smaller uh, outer diameter in order to reduce uh, the, um, the effect on the stiffness of the earplug but you need a very large opening to avoid the high frequency roll off. So you can imagine that after a couple months playing with the acoustical properties of those tubes, the various materials, we really became uh, experts in tubes. Tubes are us. That was really our statement. And we did test them at length in uh, ERCAL labs. So here you see a test on what we call an acoustical test fixtures uh, using a heated uh, model. And we are testing here what we call the self-insertion loss uh, of that tube. So the next question was really how will we uh, hold that microphone doublet in place? It needs to be close to the ear. And here again, you know, I was really into uh, providing, uh, you know, pamphlets every time I could. And so you see here my long hairs at the time. And I proposed simply to hang the microphone around the ear with a little uh, sono braid, that's the name. And fortunately, uh, this design was not adopted by the, uh, the team. So you'll see that uh, nowadays, Aero products are not featuring that they have a much uh, cleverer design with uh, safety glasses. You'll see that in a minute. 
So the, um, the deal was cut with this company, uh, Aero, and I spent a lot of time with Elliot Berger, so really Mr. Earplug, Mr. Foamplug, designing what would be the joint interface of that software. So the Sonopass software was rebranded, and you see here how we uh, had some mock-up of the screens and how we did uh, have new designs to support the new uh, Aero products, the non-custom products and the custom products. And we even included uh, some work that we had done during the uh, American National Standard Institute uh, working group uh, using what we call the noise reduction statistics. So I was uh, happy to see yesterday the earplug um, uh, attenuation, hearing protection attenuation session that the NRS is uh, being used. And indeed, that was the first time it was presented in a, in a software at that time. And uh, eventually, in 2006, that uh, software was finalized, co-branded with um, with uh, EAR as a Sono Fit and uh, with uh, Sonomax as the uh, Sonopass software. So here, just to give you a break from a strong French accent, I'll uh, have you uh, listen to a little two-minute video. So that's really a commercial video, but it's 19 years old. So bear with me. Uh, the two products that are advertised on this uh, video are no longer available, so the Sono Custom Earplug is no longer relevant. It's, uh, it has been shelved. And as for the ear fit system that you may recognize, it has been uh, greatly improved uh, since uh, that time. With the dangers of hearing loss and increase of hearing loss claims, employers, safety directors, and hearing conservation professionals are faced with a critical question. What level of protection are workers really receiving from a hearing protector? On the job, in the real world. Now, EAR has the answer, the EarFit Validation System. Until now, estimated protection levels were obtained using different test methods and derating schemes, often with conflicting answers. The most popular performance indicator is the noise reduction rating, NRR, label on a hearing protector's package. This number is based on a protector being perfectly fit in the ear canal by a professional under ideal conditions. Hardly the case in the real world, where as you see here, fit can be far from perfect, and conditions can be anything but ideal. Combine these factors with the unique shape of every person's ear canals, and it's easy to realize. Different people in different places are getting different protection levels. So who's getting protection, and how much are they getting? Well, now you can stop guessing and start knowing, because with the ear fit validation system, a technician can come on site and test, validate, and document the amount of protection each person is getting quickly, simply, and accurately. Here's how the system works. EarFit's unique field microphone in real ear, F. Meyer technology, provides accurate, unbiased measurement. Keys to the system are a small dual element microphone, advanced algorithm, and specially probed hearing protectors developed by EAR. Subjects fit their own test protector, just as they would on the job. Then the technician connects one microphone to the tube of the protector, leaving the other microphone exposed to the external sound field. When the technician activates the sound source, both the level inside and outside the ear are measured. It only takes eight seconds to obtain data at seven standard frequencies and ultimately validate a personal attenuation rating, or PAR, for each individual. That's only eight seconds, and the critical protection question is answered. Then it's documented, with all PAR results being reviewed with the Hearing Conservation Program Administrator. These results are stored in a database and accessible for future reference. This information may be valuable for comparative purposes and in substantiating insurance claims. The EarFit validation system is test compatible with a variety of EAR hearing protectors, including the new Custom Ear, the only custom ear plug molded on site and ready to wear in minutes. Custom Ear is form fit to the shape of each ear canal by filling the plug's bladder chamber with a silicone solution. Once the silicone mold is set, the plug's acoustic seal is validated using the EarFit system. Then, protection levels can be tailored to specific wearer needs by inserting calibrated filters. Custom Ear makes getting personalized protection, fit, and comfort easier than ever. The EarFit Validation System. Test, validate, and document. 
Now you can stop asking the question about hearing protection levels and start knowing the answers for every worker. With the EarFit Validation System, available exclusively from the leader in hearing conservation and protection, EAR. All right, so that's uh, always uh, very effective, I think, and uh, I was definitely, as a young PhD student, proud to see Americans endorsing that system. And eventually what happened is that in 2008, uh, Aero was acquired by 3M. So you may have seen now that uh, EarFit system are being uh, offered commercially by, by 3M. But uh, one thing that was sure at that time is that you know, uh, my PhD project was gone, the baby was gone, and we were really uh, facing a, a critical question, I should say. And the critical question was, well, what shall we do now at Sonomax now that this is uh, sold uh, to uh, 3M? And so I had uh, no answer at that time unless uh, you know, I knew for my next uh, haircut, I knew definitely that I would you know, adopt that uh, shaving thing. But that's all, this is really uh, everything I knew. Chapter three, sound reproduction. So fortunately, this is actually Nick Lapel, and he had an idea. So he's the business guy and he's always, you know, full of ideas. And he said, well, Jeremy, we should go back to one market that could be of interest is that, you know, in 2007, the iPhone was out. You may remember that. And everybody was, you know, about listening to their music on their iPod and iPhone and portable music players were everywhere. So he said, well, let's go to the consumer world and let's try to have instantly custom molded earphones uh, that could be launched uh, into um, some retails. And actually, this is a prototype, a pre-launch uh, series that was uh, released through the uh, Virgin uh, Mega Stores uh, in New York. So that was a big uh, co-branding. And all the concept was to get caged. So that was the idea that you were completely isolated with those earphones that were custom molded, and you would be uh, only listening to your music. So very good product in, uh, by design. And several uh, famous uh, people got caged in New York City uh, in 2008. So you see here uh, Herbie Hancock. And uh, Nick, again, on the right side, uh, met his uh, you know, uh, inspiration for haircut, I guess. That was uh, Sir uh, Richard Branson. And uh, unfortunately, for a small uh, Canadian uh, company, the consumer market is not easy. So you may not know, but when you're buying a product, uh, 200 bucks, so let's say earphones, they have to cost less than $10 to manufacture, everything included. So we were really over expensive uh, with this uh, product, and we, f we had to find a way to make the products much cheaper. And you may remember that there was always a technician to inflate that earpiece. So one of the first solutions was, well, can we get the technician out of the loop and get an automated system so that you don't, have to, you don't need a human person to do that injection process? And so that's the idea of developing a self-fitted earpiece. And you can see here uh, my first attempts at monitoring the uh, pressure and volume that were injected. And here this is on uh, my colleague uh, Michael Turgot. And um, you can see that we, he was really under the gun to have that uh, delivered. And uh, it took us actually um, just a couple iterations to find a system that was completely pressure controlled. So for those of you who are familiar with the, the, the process of creeping flows, you may remember that for viscous fluids, uh, crippling flows keep you uh, constant pressure. And that's actually the trick that is being used here in that pump. And we were able to release uh, very precisely the right amount of silicone for every ear canal. So here you see the version 4 of that earpiece and here I'll be just uh, telling you how we did that uh, through that little uh, animation. So you see the pumps with the silicone would be in this black headband. We would activate uh, the, there are springs, it's spring loaded, we would activate the pump and you see the liquid uh, black silicone that flows in and inflates the earpiece. And so once this is uh, cured, that takes three minutes, you can remove uh, the, uh, the headband, the pump, and you have a solid earpiece that can be transformed in anything. So here, uh, for example, that was in a hearing protection, and that's actually a product that Sonomax tried to launch, a self-fitted custom hearing protector device uh, that could be fitted by workers you know, in place and to, um, to offer some comfort and, uh, and performance. Unfortunately, that was a commercial failure because we didn't have a major distributor at that time for the, for the product. 
but we as well decided to go for the earphones I mentioned. So remember, 2011, you are all having your uh, microphone dangling wires and you are all speaking to your microphone, hanging your, this on the cable. That's exactly the design we took. But here again, I had to uh, create some good you know, sound uh, responses for that uh, earpiece. And um, the uh, speaker that you see in this earpiece were actually speakers taken from the um, cell phone industry. So they are very cheap, very inexpensive. Remember our $10 uh, target. And the trick was to really put them into a little uh, package, a box, and to create what we call the bass reflex. So several of you know what a bass reflex is. This is a Helmholtz resonator that is tuned to enhance the low frequency response of your uh, loudspeaker. And so if you model that in the electroacoustic domain, this is what you get. You get that uh, extra resonance. And that was the frequency response that we were uh, aiming at. So this is what we call the target frequency response. We wanted the earpieces to sound like this. And after several iterations, we eventually got that frequency response. That was not too far. Uh, I was just a little bit afraid that the high frequencies were not exactly uh, crystal clear. And so I gave that, back, that prototype back to Nick for testing. And he came back and said, well, Jeremy, this, doesn't, this uh, really doesn't work. So I was like, well, what's the issue? Is that the high frequency? They are not that sharp? He says, no, it's missing bass. So I said, well, no, the bass are just fine. This is exactly what the target is. He said, no, no, we need more bass. So I said, OK, let's uh, you know, increase the vent or the, uh, the tube of that Helmholtz uh, resonator. And you see here in yellow, we had a boost, bass boost. And I gave that back to Nick, and he said, yeah, the test panel say it's better, but it's not there yet. So I was like, well, this is already too much bass. But you want more bass, I'll give you more bass. So I was just increasing the tube like crazy. And eventually, I reached to that point, And they came back with the uh, test results saying, yeah, this is great. That's a great sounding product. And actually, <laughs> uh, I had to, the opportunity one day to meet who the test panels were, the golden ear panels uh, was. And it was actually one person, one old DJ, audio recorder that was really spinning disc, but probably with a good hearing loss, and he really enjoyed that frequency response. So sometimes you have to be a little bit careful about who your uh, golden ears are. Nevertheless, uh, the product was you know, a commercial, uh, not a commercial, but a technical success. It was very cool. They were really the very first um, instant custom molded earphones on the market, and we got several prices, including uh, in 2012, the uh, CES uh, awards for best uh, innovation. Unfortunately, that was another commercial uh, failure because a lot of people did not understand the design of that product. They thought that the headband with the pump were the final product. So they said, well, it really looks ugly. This is not a very cool design. But they were obviously only uh, the injection pumps. So that's really hard when you're in a small company to obviously uh, sell with a brand that was not known. Uh, nobody would pay that price you know, for a product that is uh, not branded uh, Sony or Apple. Ears was obviously unknown at the time. And so again, uh, we had to move to another idea. So let's open uh, book number two. Book number two about uh, communication in noise. And uh, so to help communicating in noise, uh, two things can be done. Obviously, hearing aids that are those uh, personal amplifiers for sound and speech uh, are useful. And uh, the idea as well to capture the speech to communicate better. And that speech will be captured in our application inside the ear canal. So you'll see that the microphone is not here. It's not uh, on the throat. It's not on the skull. It's really inside the ear canal. And you'll see how we can pick up that, noise, that speech and transmit that over uh, radio. So, chapter five, hearing aids. So this is actually my colleague Michael. You know, remember that guy under the gun, and he was uh, here pressed to uh, deliver a hearing aid prototype based on that earpiece that you've seen now. And the idea was to have a very modular design. So again, the concept was that we could really go into the market of instant custom fitted hearing aids, and people would just walk in get the custom mold, and then uh, get the custom fit, uh, fitting profile, and after an hour, get basically their hearing aids. So that was really a little revolution that we wanted to, uh, to do. And after several months and a lot of money, we actually got that uh, to that prototype. So you see uh, on the left the uh, earpiece that you're familiar with. It has an orange insert. And on the right side, you do have the hearing aid with the uh, digital uh, signal processor inside. And that's uh, completely uh, custom molded to the uh, to the ear canal. 
So at the end, you do get uh, something that was, you know, uh, 14 years ago, quite uh, 15 years ago, quite a good platform with a very robust uh, DSP, good microphone and a good uh, DSP. And the idea was to go to Walmart and for 500 bucks be able to release that as a digital uh, hearing aid. And that actually happened, except that what we didn't foresee is that the DSP manufacturers was as well uh, providing to other hearing aid manufacturers, and that was nece not necessarily uh, you know, uh, very satisfying, so they were warned to not continue in that uh, venue, and uh, the venture was a short list of, uh, that was, I would say, too much of a disruptive uh, endeavor. So that's the short story of that uh, hearing aid technology. And, um, well, I'll um, skip chapter four for a reason. We'll go back to this uh, digital audio filtering. Chapter four, digital audio filtering. So I have a question for you. Uh, when you have such a device, so it's very powerful uh, DSP, you have the microphone outside, you have a speaker inside, what will you do with this? Jeremy. Yeah? Study brain plasticity. Oh, oh that's excellent. Thank you, Vim. That's a... Uh, Excellent. We always have a, you know, sharp cookies in our lecture room. So thank you for that. Indeed, we could study brain plasticity. Why not? And this is actually the idea from Mark Schoenwissner. You just heard his voice. And his idea was, well, can we trick the brain into new functions and study that and study how the auditory sense has been altered? So this is the uh, paper that we co-authored um, back in the days. And the idea was to really uh, look at what we call the uh, tonotopicity. So that's a little bit uh, technical, but you all know that uh, sound are really projected on the special domain in the ear. So this is like a uh, piano keyboard, the low frequencies on one uh, side, medium, high frequencies. And um, how it's projected, it's, um, it's done on the cochlea and along all the auditory pathway. And if you do uh, MRI, you can really see clearly what cells are activated with the various frequencies. And you see that all frequencies are treated differently. So this is just like an FFT that is being uh, plotted. And so here the idea was, well, let's design an earplug that will be completely transparent. So you see here the attenuation is zero, except at one kilohertz, we have a notch filter. So this earpiece, if you wear it, you don't hear, you hear everything but the one kilohertz that you don't hear at all. And what happened is that uh, the researcher, Mark, uh, won that earpiece for a week. And every day he would do some uh, imaging on his brain and on, its, uh, on the cortex, auditory cortex, to see how the auditory uh, cortex was mapped in terms of tonotopicity. And you see here the uh, frequency response of the, uh, of the transparent earpiece and the notch uh, filter. And you see here uh, the results of the uh, functional MRI, so fMRI, uh, and you see the voxels, so the various uh, frequencies are illustrated, the various colors. And if you look on the first day, which is the C condition, and if you look on the last day, which is the D condition, you can see really something very, uh, uh, very revealing, is that the yellow zone, which is the one kilohertz, uh, sorry, sorry, the green zone, which is the one kilohertz, actually got overloaded by the two adjacent frequencies. You, so you can see that it disappeared, and the two other frequencies just reused that space that was uh, available, that was idle. So you can see that if you're counting the uh, voxels, and you can see the one kilohertz before that was used, and then it's not used anymore uh, after seven days, and you can see that the two adjacent frequencies, so 0 0.6 and 1.6 kilohertz, will reclaim that space and actually the brain just remapped. He said, well, there are three neurons, I'll use them for the other frequencies. So that was really the first time uh, in 2009 that we were able to prove that in less than a week, the brain remaps, and this is what we call the brain plasticity. Another uh, study he did, what I found really intriguing, and you probably enjoyed that too, was looking into the uh, localization cues. So you know that if I'm clicking my fingers in front of me here, on my left side, the reason I know it's from coming from my left are basically because of two cues. So the first one is that it's a little bit louder on my left ear than on my right ear, right? And the second one is that it go, comes a little bit faster on my left ear than on my right ear, right? So this is how I know that something is coming from my left. So what he did ask me now was simply to trick uh, the brain by adding simply some delay in that earpiece. So we added a delay that was uh, less than one millisecond, that was so that everything that was presented in front of me 
would sound actually like it was coming from the left because it was delayed in my right ear. You see the trick? So that's how he uh, did that uh, specialization study. And if I look at the results in the time uh, over days, you see that the people were really good at uh, the gazing, so they were able to assess that, yes, at time zero, or even before fitting the earpiece, they were good. If you present the sound in the front, people are telling you this is coming from the front. Then you fit uh, the earpiece with the delay, and instantly they will tell, well, no, the sound is no longer coming from the front because I have this delay in the right ear. It seems like it's coming from the left. And you see that on the first day, they are all fooled, and everybody believes that sounds are coming from the left. But then over the days, if you study over and over, you realize that the brain learns, oh, this is actually sounding that is coming from the left, but it's actually coming from the front. So the brain reacts and relearn that there is a new uh, thing. But Mark is a very nasty researcher. So you know what he did on the last day? He actually tested people and then suddenly removed the earpieces. So if you remove the earpieces and now you still have the sound coming from the front, but the brain has been trained to offset, what do you think will happen with the detection? So by a show of hands, who thinks that the, uh, there will be an overcompensation and people will gaze at the right? So thank you, you guys are following, this is cool. Unfortunately, this is not what happened. And this is really surprising. As soon as you remove the earplugs, the people were right able to tell you, well, the sound is coming from the front. So we're like, well, how is that? Is that because the brain felt that there was no earpiece anymore, so they re reacted to that? And the answer, and this is actually coming from those graphs that I cannot interpret, was remember there are two cues that were used by the human. Uh, so the interval level difference, so difference in level, and the difference in time. And what happened is that the brain realized over you know, a week that the time was completely off because every time you had something that was picking in front of you, you heard it from the left, so he said, it's crap, let's use the ILD. So this is probably what happened, is that the brain just changed indicator and said, okay, let's rely on the new indicator rather than the old one. And this is what happens in your brain. So this is, I think, some valuable uh, insight. And it tells you that you know, just doing a single processing can be sometimes uh, helpful for science. So I would say that for me, uh, that was really meeting that mark was a marking moment. And I realized that I really enjoy science as well uh, as technology. So when a position opened at ETS, I applied to it to become a full um, uh, professor, so a tenure track professor. But Sonomax asked me for further research, and we finally funded what we called an industrial research chair. So the CRITIAS stands for the uh, industrial research chair in in-year technologies, and we kept uh, doing uh, developments uh, together. So I'll go back uh, to book two and fast forward to uh, 20, uh, 2000, uh, well, <laughs> I'll go back to the chapter seven and uh, mention the in-year speech capture. So fast forward to 2017, uh, together with my first uh, PhD student, we developed um, a system that was actually embarked on this uh, communication device designed by ears. And the system was, as I was mentioning, picking up your voice from inside uh, the ear canal. So here you have a, um, a box that the wearer is, uh, worker is wearing. And as soon as the person press on the push to talk button, can speak over the radio using that in-ear microphone. And what you can do as well, is that um, you can <clears throat> you realize that this is the in-ear microphone so even if you do have something on top of the mouth it doesn't matter because you hear clear this is the same sound whatever you do so that was perfect for all the respiratory um, work and people that had to wear a gas mask and other um, chemical protection and uh, that device does as well fit tests so here this is a failed test you see the red marker and here this is green because the test has been passed and the earpiece is uh, well fitted. So again, that uh, eventually got the attention of some major manufacturer. And nowadays, this is a system that is uh, commercialized and offered by 3M. I think they released that uh, last year in the United States. So that may come in Europe uh, soon. And that's um, very useful for uh, very uh, many protection. But what's interesting is that uh, ears kept the rights for some uh, non-occupational uh, products and went actually to the business of the biomedical uh, uh, imaging systems. So if you guys have been into an MRI machine, you may know that it's very loud, so it's very noisy. It's dangerous for the uh, patient, for the practitioners as well, and it's very hard to communicate. So the idea was simply to adapt that uh, system 
and make it completely non-ferromagnetic to be able to work into an MRI room and uh, be able to have communication and protection at the same time. So here I'll be just showing you a little uh, demo uh, that was recorded by one of uh, EARS engineer uh, recently. Hi, this is uh, Max Henry from EARS Global and I'm here with uh, Nathan who's in the board. Hello, my name is Nathan. I'm in the board right now. We are running uh, live imaging with a steady state free procession. Absolutely. So here clearly Max uh, could not be heard if that was just an ambient microphone, uh, but as soon as he turned in uh, to the in-ear microphone, uh, everything was uh, clear, or at least uh, clearer uh, for the uh, communication aspect. So um, last chapter, because we are running um, into uh, proper timing, the uh, book number three about biosensing. So there are many applications that you can do once you have an in-ear microphone. So the thing that we realize is that, for example, this microphone inside the ear not only capture your voice, but it can capture your heartbeat. So I can hear clearly your heart beating. I can hear your breathing sound. So by the nose, by the mouth, uh, I can have this. If I add new sensors, for example, temperature, I can people monitored, for example, some fertility cycles uh, for women. You can monitor uh, overheat uh, from workers. Uh, there are many conditions that can be uh, measured. The fact that you can put some accelerator, accelerometers inside the ear, make it so that you monitor the head movement, so you can have all the dynamic aspect of things. So repetitive movement, uh, fall down, uh, man down situations for firefighters, first responders. Uh, we can put as well uh, some physiological uh, sensors, so think of uh, skin conductance, uh, galvanic conductivity, electrodermal activity. All this is possible from inside the ear. We distort the ear canal, I mentioned that when you chew, so we can detect your face, am I smiling or not behind my face, those are things we can capture from inside the ear. And we can do EEG, so electrophysiology uh, and electro um, electrocochography or electroencephalography is a very um, funny experiment to do. Putting electrodes inside the ear canal uh, give you that, uh, that access. I'll be just presenting here for sake of time the biosignal measurements. And uh, um, here I'll be giving you a little demo of other signals that we hear inside your ear canal. So I mentioned the heartbeats and the breathing rate, but you'll see that we can actually detect everything that happens. So I heard a sneeze or somebody sneezing over there. That's actually something very loud inside the ear canal. Let's listen to that demo uh, from one of our students. So here I am wearing the device which is connected to the ARP platform and here it's classifying in real time uh, what the microphone hears. So here I'm talking and it's classifying his voice. If I click my teeth, it was classifying as a clicking of the teeth, clicking of the tongue, Same thing. Uh, it can also classify coughing. <coughs> uh, and uh, blinking of the eyes forcefully. And closing of the eyes too. Uh, it can also classify saliva noise uh, from inside the, the mouth. And uh, that's it. So here I am wearing the device which is connected to the ARP platform and here it's classifying in real time uh, what the microphone hears. So here I'm talking and it's classifying his voice. If I click my teeth, it was classifying as uh, clicking of the teeth, clicking of the tongue, same thing. Uh, it can also classify coughing. <coughs> uh, and. Uh, blinking of the eyes forcefully and closing of the eyes too. Uh, it can also classify saliva noise uh, from inside the, the mouth. And uh, that's it. All right, so I think here you can really acknowledge that the machine learning and all the AI is already very powerful to detect all those, uh, those noises. And the beauty was that to the manufacturer, I was just saying, well, you just use the same microphone, we just add some algorithm to it, and this is no extra cost for a very 
um, for many new features, new functionalities for uh, health monitoring for workers, for health monitoring for even during the COVID time, we had applications, uh, you know, monitoring uh, somebody's uh, health and so on. Nevertheless, uh, you just saw one of my students, and this tells me as well, one or uh, reveals one very important aspect of the research, is that research can only be done with uh, human beings, actually. And so here you see uh, a group uh, picture taken during a workshop that we had uh, together with some of the EARS engineers. We are on EARS side of the building. We are just across the corridor uh, for our lab. But you see here that we have uh, you know, some common, uh, common uh, wheel. Nevertheless, we have very different you know, uh, targets and topics. So you know that academics don't work exactly at the same pace as industrial, but industrial don't go as deep as academics. So here I'll just take a couple of minutes just to share a little bit how eventually over 20 years of collaborating with an industrial partner, we found actually a common uh, uh, ground. And what we uh, define is what we call the green machine. So you'll see on the uh, left, that's me, Jay, with blue color. And on the right side, that's Nick, with uh, yellow color. And we perceive ourselves really as turbines. So we are two uh, engines. We funnel a lot of uh, things. And what I do funnel is basically bodies. So students, new heads, new people that are coming in with new ideas. And basically, what happens during their academic training uh, with uh, me at the University of Quebec, they do obviously uh, well, either uh, grow up and get uh, you know, a diploma, a PhD, uh, or master, or postdoc. Uh, they do get articles, or patents, or um, whatever prototype. And sometimes, uh, most of the times, they are grown up uh, from that experience and completely uh, blue painted. Some of them would exit the system at that time, what we call the ecosystem. Some of them would actually uh, die from that experience, but most of them would actually uh, hope to be joined by other elements and to go through the uh, process of being recruited by EARS to continue their training. And the training that is offered by the industrial partner is really making them into green. You understand that blue and yellow gives you that green color. And they are really now trained as well on all the business aspects and hands-on uh, aspects with hopefully new you know, products. So you see that parcel, that surprise, and those are actually uh, people that would be uh, reused in the ecosystem, so they either stay at EARS or come back to Critias, but this is really how that works. And those products that are being produced can be uh, you know, commercialized by big players, so go to market players like 3M we mentioned, uh, Meta was as well in the loop, or Cook Medical for the biomedical system that I've just uh, shown you. So that's a little bit uh, what we see, and obviously money matters, and money is made from those uh, sales and comes back two years and then to the university. So this is really a win-win uh, system that took uh, several years uh, to, uh, to build up. There are always you know, uh, tensions, but still this is uh, what we um, succeeded in. And uh, really the human person that we are uh, training, we call them talents, uh, that's a really a pipeline, so a pipeline of people that will be uh, later uh, going to the uh, Kenyan market or stay within this ecosystem as we uh, mentioned. And some of the early uh, you know, graduated were all poached by uh, foreign companies, so for example uh, the first four of them were uh, going where, went to Apple, for example, and we were able to you know rescape or escape a couple of them and have them back to ears, and so we have now really a, a team that is local and very uh, very strong for all those electroacoustic uh, aspects. So that's uh, that's uh, every technology we can do, and you know my dream is really that we could all fit these uh, devices into uh, one uh, one ear, one human ear. And the devices, I call that the human pacifier. So I really see that as a, something would be doing everything we mentioned. And uh, you know that may sound a little bit like sci-fi, but if you look back into the days, you may have seen that movie, Her, from 2013. So uh, starring Joachim uh, Phoenix. And you remember the idea that this person falls in love with an AI and is completely uh, hooked up through the ear. And that was obviously sci-fi in 2013, but look at now, nowadays. And so I think really the future is that this worker will one day benefit from all this technology and will soon be uh, completely protected you know, through uh, the technology developed by Critias ears and maybe you, if you're interested. So this is uh, not the end of the uh, story, that's the end of my talk, but this is to be continued. And if you're interested in joining forces, here is my contact information.